Fantastic, Dave. It's it's great to get a chance to finally talk to you about continuous delivery, considering you're the one who uh, wrote the book on the subject. <laughs> yeah, it should be fun today, I think. Absolutely. And so one of the things that uh, is interesting to me about continuous delivery specifically is we hear about all these success stories uh, all the time. So for example, ASOS, they went from doing 20 releases a year down to doing 20 releases a day. Uh, but then we also see companies like Tesla and SpaceX can basically disrupting the major industries they're in. So Tesla for motor, SpaceX for, uh, I guess, aeronautical. And then we also will talk about Volvo for a little bit. And they went from doing six months to get a line of code into production down to 20 minutes. Now, I always have to ask this question because I know that you worked with Volvo. Why did it take so long to get that one single line of code into production? Why did it take that six months to happen? Uh, so I, I think for reasons that everybody would probably recognize uh, like many traditional organizations they spent uh, a lot of time growing up uh, approaches to software development that would allow them to manage them and you know treat safety with care and all of those kinds of things and what that did was just add ever longer delays from the point at which you have an idea to the point at which you get that out into production uh, because the ceremony the the the, the, the you know the the overhead of all of that stuff just slowed everything down uh, completely. Um, and that's problematic because as those delays go longer, it means that the stuff that you're putting into production starts to get bigger and more complicated. And that causes more problems than the, the, the gates try and protect you from. Um, so they, they changed. They started apply, adopting the, the, the approaches to continuous delivery. And I think one of the key ideas in continuous delivery, one of the things that it does is it starts to force down the batch size, the, the scale of the changes that you are dealing with. Ideally, when working with continuous delivery, we're going to start working with very small changes. We're going to evaluate them very quickly. And then we're going to understand more clearly what that change means. And because it's small, it's going to be simpler to understand if, it's, uh, if there's something wrong with the change. It's going to be easier to spot if there's a mistake and, and easier to, to step back from a mistake if we make one. It, it limits the, the blast radius, I suppose, of mistakes uh, that, uh, that cause a problem. Um, and, and so I, I think that Volvo had built up the kind of institutional scar tissue that's common in big organisations, particularly in big organizations doing things that you'd think of as safety critical um, mm -hmm. then you know people want to try and be cautious they're going to try and take care and and so on and so you know the traditional response to that is to go more slowly and i think that what we have learned is that that's a mistake yeah i i, I always find that's one of the greatest ironies about having these change approval boards and all of this ceremony that goes along for the ride is that you end up making it more risky because it does take so long that, okay, now we're only going to do a deployment once a quarter. And yeah. if you're going to do a deployment once a quarter or once every six months, imagine the change set that you're going to put in. It's, it's, like, it's almost a hope and a prayer that nothing goes wrong at that point. There's, yeah, and, and that's backed up by, by, by the state of DevOps research and the, the stuff you know, recorded in the, the Accelerate book, which, which, which literally says that a change approval board is negatively correlated with quality because while it might, it might you know, provide those gates that you have to go through, it slows it down and so increases the, you know, the technical thing is it increases the, the batch size of changes and that ups the risk and lowers the quality. So the more of those gates you put in, the lower quality code you produce in, the, in reality rather than higher when you actually measure the, the quality of the code based on how many defects there are in production. And, so, yeah. and, and time to recover from, from, from those defects. So, so you know, it, it, it's counterintuitive, sure, but, but the more diligent that we are in that respect, the worse, the worse it is. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think we... <laughs> I think I used an analogy earlier uh, when we were talking where it's, it's kind of like eating a sandwich. So if you're going to eat a sandwich, it's a lot easier to eat the sandwich if you're taking smaller bites versus having just like one massive bite. I'm not going to try to shove that entire sandwich down my mouth, down my throat and hope that, man, I hope I don't choke on something like this. And it's 
very similar to doing the exact same thing with your code. And you, yeah. you want to deploy these small changes that make things much easier to measure. It's I, it, I also think back to when I'm troubleshooting my computer, I try to change one thing at a time. Or if I'm troubleshooting my desktop, I'll you know remove as much as I can and then get it working and then add one thing at a time to kind of troubleshoot. Okay, well, now I know that's what caused my problem. Yes, and, 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 that, and that gets into some fairly deep stuff. I, I, uh, I, am, I am coming to the, the end of the process of writing a book that I've, I've been spending, spending the last two or three years writing uh, about what engineering should mean for software development. And uh, this, is one of, this is one of those, the, those things that, you know, engineers, uh, you know, when, when you think about design engineering, where you, you're kind of exploring and researching and trying to figure out how to, you know, how to solve a problem, then you, you absolutely start applying that kind of scientific rationalism. How do you control the variables? How do mm -hmm. I carry out experiments and limit the variable so that I can really understand what I'm learning from it from uh, from my experiments if I if I'm an airplane designer I'm going to build little models and put them in a wind wind tunnel so I can you know eliminate all of the extraneous detail so that I can measure the, that effect and it's the same kind of thing by certainly by reducing the size of changes that's one way in which we can control those variables and limit our change and and that spreads much more much further than just the technical front mm -hmm. if we can if we're releasing changes into production every three months how do you know which changes you really landed with your users and which ones didn't how do you know that if we're releasing changes more frequently than that we can say ah you know probably, you know our, our sales went up at this point when this change mm -hmm. landed you know it's 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 easier to tell <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, and this kind of goes back to, if we bring it back to software development just in general, um, I, I kind of think about, you know, we have these smaller changes, but it also goes back to say, even your branching strategies. Because I, I when I, I think in our, some of our earlier conversations, I, I think I mentioned like, hey, you should do feature branch stuff and everything. Like, no, I don't like feature, I mean, like you like very short feature branches, but you much prefer the trunk-based development approach. I do, and 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 one of my things that I'm, one of the things that I'm work, you know, that I'm trying to bring to my work is this more kind of rationalist approach to thinking about how these things stitch together. So I'm trying to build up a coherent picture, and so I like I like to take definitions seriously and think about what they mean and so on. So let's, if you start from the idea of continuous integration, the original description of continuous integration was which you know Kent Beck's team published in the 1990s on the C2 wiki was along the lines of imagine for a moment that you're working as part of a team and uh, as soon as I, I make a change on your team you see that change and you see its impact with your software mm -hmm. that's the goal of continuous integration almost inst instantaneous feedback on my changes as a collaborator with you on on a team or, and everybody else. So continuous integration is focused at tr on trying to achieve as close to that as we can as we can get. So we're going to commit frequently small changes and to some shared line of code, and then we can see whether my stuff screws your stuff up or Joe's stuff screws our stuff up or whatever else it is. We can see that much more que clearly and much more quickly. But at the same. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Okay, but I was going to say, but at the same time, it's you still want to have a deployable piece of code. Like you, when you check in those changes, when you merge your your small changes, your small feature branches into your trunk, that code should still be able to be releasable at that point. It shouldn't just absolutely. be like, I hope it all works type of thing. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and and that's that's part of the discipline. So 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 continuous integration is about this kind of instant evaluation of just does our stuff work together. Mm -hmm. Then. Continuous delivery takes that a step further in saying, let's work so our code is permanently in a releasable state. That's my preferred definition of continuous delivery. It's not really about how frequently you push it into production. It's about how often you get feedback that, yes, all of this stuff is releasable. Uh, and, it, and then, as you say, what that means is that each little change has to be to some notion of production completeness. Um, 
branching, feature branching, any form of branching is about isolating chain. So it's kind of on the other end of the spectrum from continuous integration. So there are trade-offs there between what mm -hmm. you get from one and what you get from the other. And the trouble with branches is that they hide that information and that hide that picture of a shared state of releasability. If I'm going to wait until my feature is complete before I merge it with your features, we, we're going to get, we're not going to get a very clear picture of whether our features work together or not. And so, so that's problematic. Continuous delivery then, sorry, continuous integration kind of gives it, you know, we want to work in these small changes. Continuous delivery says we want to do these things in a releasable state. So that challenges us to now start to think, well, how can I work in a way where I can make progress in tiny changes that, pro that probably don't yet add up to a feature but still maintain my software in a releasable state. And that introduces ideas like dark launching, where we, we're going to put stuff into production that actually isn't wired up yet for, you, for real people to use. Or branch by abstraction, where we might have two versions. We can have the old version of a change and, and the new version mm -hmm. that's coming along. We can kind of decide whether we run them in parallel or or you know, uh, and to, to measure the new one or, or, or switch them over or whatever else. And then the last one, which everyone's heard of, is feature flags, where you toggle behavior on and off uh, with switches. All of those are strategies to do what we call in continuous delivery speak to separate deployment from release. We want the ability to deploy changes into production that are not going to damage anything, that are perfectly safe, perfectly you know, complete as far as those changes go, but that don't yet necessarily add up to a whole feature. Oh, one of the things I really like about that whole thought process is I can then, once it's out in production, I can have say beta testers or I can have internal people try out those kinds of features. If I had the ability to some sort of flagging mechanism, some sort of if then statement, whatever the case, whatever you prefer, you can jump in and go, okay, yes, this is working how I expect it to work in production. And if it's not working exactly, that's fine. The only people that are really affected are your beta testers or a handful of uh, selected people. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a huge value. Uh, the, there's, there's a great uh, presentation. I've forgotten her surname, Melissa somebody um, from Pinterest. Um, mm. uh, and and she, did a great, she, uh, she did a great presentation uh, about, um, about them doing a complete rewrite of their UI. And they were, they were in production with two versions of the UI for 18 months as they mm. grew this new version in parallel with the old version. And they got beta tested. They, they got people that had opted in that were using the new version and giving them feedback. And they were, they were doing experiments where they were measuring things in terms of you know, the two versions in parallel with one another. And it just gives you this wonderful experimental platform where you're bit, you can start to treat your business as an, ex, you know, as an experimental business, not, not just in terms of the technology, but also in terms of your product design and the evolution of that as well. And I, I kind of bringing this back to my own personal experience, I worked on a loan origination system at a bank prior to working at Octopus Deploy. And we had our quote unquote legacy system or classic system, I think is what we call it to make it feel less old. <laughs> and then we were working on the brand new next generation system. And we were, we were working on them in parallel and the way that we, we kind of had that working was the next generation system could talk to the classic mm -hmm. systems database and it could read it, but it would present the information in a completely different and in, in, in new way that made it much more usable to, to our users based on all their feedback. But then when they clicked on certain things, they would be sent back to that classic system. So we were kind of causing them to have to go between two systems for a little while. Yeah. But in the end, it actually worked out really well because we could iterate very, very, very fast on the brand new system. But on the classic system, I'm like, okay, that stays as is. It's, you know, we'll, we'll fix bugs. It's kind of more of a maintenance mode at that point in time. You can also think of this as kind of looping back to the thing that we were talking about earlier on in terms of controlling the variables. Mm -hmm. I think that one of the superpowers that we have as software developers is that the, the software that we produce exists as software in a computer which means that the environment that it inhabits is this kind of little constrained universe that we create if we decide to and decide to exert sufficient control we can 
make that universe do whatever we want it to. So one of the things that one of the things that I thought was pretty cool, just go, sort of riffing from your from your uh, your story, I worked mm-hmm. with a client in the Netherlands uh, a few years ago who were doing a similar kind of revamp on their product line. Uh, they had an old system and a new system. We did some fairly nice things in terms of domain specific languages for executable specifications and acceptance tests, so that we could run the same test in bo- along both on both versions of the system. The tests kind of ex- ex- expressed the, the desirable behavior of the system in the, prob- the language of the problem domain, sort of BDD style test. And we could run that using one set of plug-in adapters against the old version of the system. Then we could, you know, we could deploy them into shared environments and run it against the new, new version of the system. And then, as you said, as we start rolling things out into production, we could correlate the behaviors of the two systems and we could see whether they were coming up with the same results where they should do and things like that before releasing the new version of the system. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I did something very similar to a completely different job. And I actually wrote a program I called Chaos Monkey that would just run through a bunch of different potential possibilities, inputs. And then I would run it through the old system and go, okay, this is the output I got. And then I do the exact same thing into the new system. And this is the output I got. Did the two match? If the two didn't match, then it would flag it at me. And then I would have to start figuring out, okay, I needed to start debugging. Okay. I have these known inputs and I have these known outputs. What was really nice about that is then I could write tests, which brings me to my, our next discussion, which is kind of this whole concept of an engineering mindset. And you mentioned this several times in your blog about having kind of this engineering scientific mindset. Now, when I think of that term engineer, I'm thinking of civil engineers, uh, the folks who build bridges and infrastructure and everything like that. And if I were to build a bridge, I would do more than just hope, you know, just throw some wires up there. And uh, I think this is my plan. No, I would build my mock-ups. I would do, you know, strength testing on various materials. I would do wind analysis to make sure it's not going to do that crazy wavy thing like we saw uh, with mm-hmm. some bridges in the past and make sure that by the time that a c- car crosses that bridge for the very first time, we know it's not going to collapse. And to me, like that's something that we need to kind of start approaching it when we start talking about these smaller changes in this continuous integration is doing these kinds of tests and this kind of analysis as well. Ab- absolutely. And, and and part of my thinking about engineering software was informed formed by a an experience in my career. I was involved in a project where we built one of the world's highest performance financial exchanges. And that was really, really, really hard. It was really <laughs> difficult to figure out how to solve the problems. It wasn't the kind of thing where you could look up look up the answer on Stack Overflow. You know, we had to we had to invent some stuff to make this work. And we we started a it was we started this project while I was in the middle of writing the continuous delivery book, which kind of gave us a leg up in, in terms of giving us an experimental focus to begin with and an experimental platform in the form of our deployment pipeline where we could try ideas out. But I really got deeply impressed by not just the quality of the work that we were able to uh, achieve when we did this slightly more focused, slightly more scientific, slightly more engineering uh, discipline kind of approach, but also that it was dramatically more efficient. It was the, both the highest quality code base that I've ever worked on, and it was the most efficient development team that I've ever worked with in terms of the rate at which we produced new features in this exchange. And that kind of impressed me. And I think this is kind of you know part of the theme for the, my new book that I, that I mentioned before. Sorry, I'm not trying to sell my new book because you can't buy it yet. I'm just referring to it because I've just... Absolutely. I've just <laughs> it's just my head's full of it at the moment, um, but um, but I, I I think I think it's I think it's a it's an interesting idea, and and I think that we make a mistake in software, and it's a common mistake that we kind of make as software developers, which is to look at other disciplines and then just kind of guess about what it is that that they do, <laughs> and because yeah. partly that's our job, partly that's our, you know partly that's what we do for a living. But in this case, you know, engineers, I think often when people think of engineering, they think of kind of heavyweight bureaucratic processes, and I don't really know where that comes from. My guess is that what people are thinking when they think of that sort of stuff is the production of physical things. If I if I make a pen like this, the design of this pen is an interesting problem and so on. But the really difficult part of this is its manufacture. Mm-hmm. The difficult 
difficult. The difficult part of this is building a factory that allows me to reproduce these in their thousands or millions at a price with quality that work every time and that kind of thing. Now, that's a problem that we never have in software because our output, as I said before, is software. It's bits and bytes. And one of the weird things about our discipline is that the cost of production is essentially free. So our, our problem, it seems to me, is, is it boils down to two things fundamentally. Fundamentally, our job is to become experts at learning and discovery, which is kind of what the design part of the problem is about. And our job is, is all about design, really. It's all about how we solve these, how we bring software to bear on solving problems. And that's the clever part of the things that we do. It's not the typing bit that matters so much. Yeah. It's the thinking bit. So, so we, we kind of, we, you know, that's, the, that's one of, you know, that's part of the focus. And for that, if we, if we want to become experts at that kind of learning, that kind of exploration and discovery, then we have a model and that's science. So we can start applying some of the ideas for science um, and that improves our ability to learn quickly. And I think it gets us to some, some fairly basic things that we would recognize. So, so we must be iterative. We must be looking at feedback. We must be working in incremental ways. And we must be working experimentally and controlling the variables as we've been discussing, those sorts mm -hmm. of ideas. And there's a second bunch of things, the second category of things that seem to matter to me, um, uh, are around managing the complexity. The software is... Software is weird, I think, and the, you know the more I've, I've been, I've made my career in software. I, I've been working in software for nearly forty years now, and what I observe, the more I observe as I gain experience, is just how deep this subject is. There's some really quite profoundly difficult things going on many of the times, and the difficulty with software is it's really easy to to write something simple and 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 you know you write a web page you know and, and do you know do something basic and those sorts of things. And I'm not decrying that, but the the danger is that it's really easy to then get into deep water really quickly, mm -hmm. and so applying some of these disciplines to manage the complexity to think in terms of managing the complexity and i think that gets back to some fairly old ideas too so you know it's about modularity cohesion separation of concerns abstraction information hiding coupling those sorts of things and taking those seriously in the way that we think design test and deploy our systems um, has a huge impact on the effectiveness and then there are sort of behaviours that allow us, that tend to encourage us to do those things. I am hubristic enough to believe that continuous delivery is one of those things. If we start really following the disciplines of continuous delivery, almost as a side effect, we get those better engineering outcomes because it mm -hmm. encourages you to write in smaller pieces. It encourages you, therefore, to write testable software. It encourages you, therefore, to create more modular software and so on and so on and so on. You know, one of the interesting things you mentioned tests a few times, and I, I want to jump back to Volvo for a second and how they went from going, you know, six months down to basically down to 20 minutes to get the, a line of code into production. And they really had to build out an entire testing infrastructure around that because each time they were ready to, you know, they checked in some code and like, okay, now we need to test this. You can't just throw it on a truck or throw it on a car and hope for the best. Uh, you're kind of involved with some of that. I was wondering if you could walk me through some of the some of the testing infrastructure they had to build out. I I, I should clarify. I I was I, I wasn't really involved. I, I I've spoken to the man that really did this. Okay, so that, fair enough. Fair enough. So this was <laughs> less down to me and more down more down to to him and his team. Absolutely. Uh, uh, but uh, but um, but yes, they did some amazing things uh, in, in order to do that. As one of the things, so so a modern Volvo truck is a complex computing device in its own right. I, there's something like 80 million lines of code in you know tens, maybe even low hundreds of different computing devices spread through the the truck uh, and and so on, and. What they do is that they test hugely in simulation because, you know, you, you can't, if, if you want to get these really fast feedback cycles, you can't be waiting for the, the physics cycle of having to burn silicon or deploy this into a real hardware device or something like that. So they, they build these massively complex simulations, which, again, as we were describing, 
create these little universes that are controlled as far as the software that's been evaluated is concerned. And then they can prod and poke the software and figure out how it works. Their simulations are so sophisticated that they do things like simulate weather conditions mm -hmm. uh, that the truck is driving through. And, um, uh, and, and they, when I last spoke to uh, uh, the t them, the, what they were thinking about doing next was this is a year or so ago what they were next thinking of doing was was starting to simulate the wear and tear on the mechanical components and how that affects the calculations that need to take place in the software and so that they could they could do these sorts of things absolutely fantastic as you, as you said they went from it taking them six months to get a single line change following their processes into a truck on a test track to 20 minutes by going through sim this, this simulation route for not for the kinds of changes where you need to burn silicon, I suppose, but for other changes. Yeah. It's, for, it's a, but, an amazing, amazing story, an amazing accomplishment and a radical change in the relationship of that team with the software that they produce and the quality of the software that they can produce. And I love that. I love that term, uh, its own little universe, because at Octopus, one of the things that we've built out is we have an entire set of testing infrastructure because we make software that's COTS, you know, it's commercial off the shelf. It's installed on various customers, you know, infrastructure and everything like that. So we try to cover as much as we can. And, you know, we have a whole suite of testing tools. For example, one of the tools we have is Tentacle Army, and it spins up a new instance of Octopus Deploy in a specific version, so we can test with it. And, and this is more for manual testing, but we can also poke and prod and maybe run some automated tests around it. But that's one of the one of the examples. We're also, as part of our normal testing pipeline, we'll spin up a, a bunch of agents that are ones running, say, uh, Windows Server 2016 with SQL Server 2017. And how well does that interact? And the next one's 2019 with you know SQL 2019. And but we're we're trying to create our own little universes to make sure that we can run all these tests on and we know that it's it's working. But this wasn't something that just happened overnight. There was a significant investment from Octopus's side. We actually have dedicated people that are just focused on building this out. And I, I imagine Volvo had the same thing. They have dedicated individuals who are focused on building out those simulators and those simulations so other developers can leverage them for their CI CD pipeline. Yes, yeah, indeed. And 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 the, the guy that I was referring to, Peter Thorngren, was the was the guy that was kind of leading that that group of people that was making that kind of change. One of one of the other things that they did as a side effect, which I thought was quite cool, largely for kind of internal marketing so they could kind of sell the idea to, to you know senior people in the organization is that they connected their simulators up to to a vr system so it could be a, a vr headset on and, and drive <laughs> the software around in, in the truck but 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 absolutely and 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 that back to this idea of engineering and exerting control if we start to apply these kinds of ideas and start to design our systems so that you know the pieces are better tested and 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 more you know that kind of means as a you know as a as a side effect of that more deterministic, it means we you know we we, we can then exert that greater control and with modern cloud techniques as you're describing we can scale that out to do millions of tests if we want to. It, mm -hmm. it's just a matter now of you know how fast do we want the results and 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 how much do we care about the quality of the systems that we produce if we care enough and if we're willing to to, to invest enough in that we can very thoroughly do this just just as an aside the, the 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 exchange that i referred to before was in production for 13 months and five days before anybody any users of the system noticed any defects oh wow I've never worked on anything with that kind of level of quality before. It's a different kind of game. And what that means is that we spent a lot more time building new stuff than we did fixing old stuff. Again, referring to the State of DevOps report, uh, the State of DevOps report says that teams that work in these kind of ways spend on average 44% more time on new things than teams that don't. That's yeah. a commercial. That's a commercial advantage right there. That's that's a you know a significant commercial impact right there in this way of working. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I think the other big lesson I kind of been kind of taking for these types of conversations is, you know, going back to that whole universe is making sure that I, I I'm designing this, my tests, my testing infrastructure, my test suites, whatever the case may be to match with what I'm trying to work on. So obviously Volvo and creating all those simulators that really is applicable to them, but it made sense in their world for the type of software that they're working on. I imagine the same thing happened with your exchange is you had a series of like your infrastructure. It made sense on something along those lines. And we did this, you know, when I worked on the, the system I was talking about where I had kind of the chaos monkey, I wouldn't write that chaos monkey for, for other systems, but it made sense in the sense of in, in the world that I was working in at that point in time. And it's kind of making, making sure that you invest where it makes sense to it matches what you're working on, I guess is what I'm getting to. That's an excellent point, and 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 I, and I hadn't I hadn't really thought of it quite this way around, but 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 one of the one of the the, the places that leads my head think, think thinking about that is that what we're talking about here is kind of um, the lean idea of continual improvement and the mm-hmm. investment in making your own job easier. So. I, you know, when when we were building our exchange, and I'm sure when 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 the Volvo team were building their, you know, their stuff, they weren't necessarily thinking. You know, the goal wasn't to build a great test framework or a great, you know, a deployment framework or whatever it is. The goal was to create releasable software, and what we found was that you know something that got in the way of release was a certain class of defects and so we wanted to find a way of better testing those so we wrote some extra infrastructure that made it easiest for easier for us to test those kinds of things and we did lots of that kind of stuff certainly mm-hmm. when uh, uh, and i think all of the organizations that i've seen that are good at continuous delivery and and these this style of working do something similar it's it, it's not about Forgive me, I'm talking to Octopus and, and you sell deployment tools, but it's not just about picking products off a shelf. Mm-hmm. It's about having a model of how to work and then adapting you know, um, tools and technologies to help you achieve the model for, that you want to try and achieve. One of the things that I, I make a living these days no longer writing software so much um, uh, as, as advising other organiza- organizations how to improve their software engineering practices and how to do this stuff better. Uh, and one of the bits of advice that I give to those sorts of organizations is that you optimize for great feedback. You optimize to go fast, whatever that takes, whatever that takes. So a deployment pipeline to me goes from commit to releasable outcome, and then you optimize to be able to learn that lesson. Is my software releasable multiple times a day? And you do whatever it takes. So whatever constitutes releasability is a test that you're going to automate in your deployment pipeline. And you're going to try and optimize all of that to give you feedback quickly enough that within a day, you can see if you've made a mistake and correct it. And it's funny you mentioned deployment pipelines and CICD pipelines, because you you have uh, some pretty concrete ideas of different phases of what your CICD pipeline should have. I was wondering if you could walk us through, uh, I think it's those three phases. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Uh, I, I, I think I think of a deployment pipeline in, as you say, three phases. The first phase is uh, the commit cycle. And the commit cycle is focused on actively supporting developers and development teams. The objective of the commit stage is to essentially fail fast. We want to be able to get very fast feedback that we've made a mistake. The whole pipeline, in fact, is really a falsification mechanism, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it. However many tests I have, I can't prove that my code is good, but if I have one failing test, I know that it's not good enough, and therefore I'm going to reject that change and go and commit something new to fix it or to, or to roll it back. Um, so the commit cycle is about giving developers great feedback on their work as they are doing it. You know, did I write, does the code do what I think the code does? You know, mm-hmm. is, is it is it good enough to make it through? So we're looking for very fast feedback. And that's going to, when we start digging into what that means, depending on the nature of our system, it probably means we don't want to be running the whole application in the for, in these tests. We don't want to be talking to databases or to file mm-hmm. systems. So we, we, if I've started planting the idea of unit testing in your head, I'm doing a decent job. That's, that's where <laughs> I'm going with that. The yeah. vast majority of these things are unit tests. And 
the best way of creating unit tests that don't slow you down is to do test first, test driven development. So you're going to write a test first, uh, and then you're going to write some code that meets the needs of the test, and then you're going to tidy up the code and the uh, and the test to make them beautiful and elegant and more general while you're in a stable passing state. And then you're going to commit to get your CI going, and then you're going to move on. Um, <clears throat> The next stage is the acceptance cycle. And the job of the acceptance cycle is really to determine the releasability of our change. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's about everything that constitutes its releasability, everything that you can think of that you would like to know before you release this into production, you want to try and find a way ideally to automate. Um, where you must have a more sophisticated human decision making and by this I don't mean some kind of dumb sign off process but you know if you have need a human beings fuzzy pattern matching you know uh, uh, brain to be able to solve a problem then you can kind of build that into the pipeline a little bit but mostly we're going to use automation to get this real fast cycle so we're going to evaluate our software from the point of view of users of our system, testing the software in production-like test environments, in lifelike scenarios, deployed and configured as close as it will be in a real system in production so that we can test all of those things too. We're going to do performance testing, scalability testing, uh, resilience testing, uh, your, chaos, your chaos thing, um, yeah. um, security testing. Uh, regulatory compliance, is your software compliant? All of those things are within the scope of a pipeline if those things determine the releasability of our software. And at the end of the, the cycle, there's nothing more to do. It's, it's, we've done everything that we need to do to determine it's releasable. Now our job is to put it into production and learn from production a new set of things. You know, do the users like these ideas? Are, 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 these, are these creating money or value for our business in some way? You know, it, it, is everything okay? You know, is this idea a good idea or a bad idea? Um, so you can think about the, 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 the first two stages, the commit cycle and the acceptance cycle are kind of the core of continuous delivery, really, mm -hmm. um, in that that's where at the prim our primary evaluation goes. And then the delivery stage is, you know, we've done all of this automation. We've done our infrastructure as code. We've managed the configurations of all of these things. We've tested all of these things. We know those work. So we certainly use the same mechanisms when we go into production because that's what we've tested. So, so we, we, we might as well close that gap as well. So whether we automate that step or not, if we automate the decision based on everything passing the pipeline and just pushing to production, that's continuous deployment. If we make it a human decision, which is fine, that's continuous delivery, which is kind of the super set. Yeah. And I, I, the phrase I always love to use when I talk, when I talk to d different people is when I go into production, it shouldn't be, quote unquote, a massive production. I, I don't need to have my entire team online. I don't need to have all the web admins and DBAs and QA. And it sounds like we're about ready to launch a rocket into space. It's like, okay, I took this thing out of, I took, I, I took the server out of load balancer. I verified it's out of load balancer. I've added it back into the load balancer, everything along those lines. It yeah. should, like you said, it should be automated, but it should be the same way of how you went to your various test environments and how you, how you deployed there. You should be, you, you should have very high confidence that it will work in production at that point. Um, Absolutely. And, and certainly, you know, I, I spent the, the, the latter part of my career working mostly in what I would think of as kind of high consequence systems, systems mm -hmm. that would hurt people if they went wrong or, or, would, or would lose them a lot of money kind of, kind of thing. And so with those kinds of systems, you don't want to be taking too many chances. You want the software to be safe. You want to be confident that it's not going to go wrong. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I, I want to have no doubts that, you know, I've tested everything that I can think of. I am certainly not going to think of everything. I'm certainly going to miss things. But if you get good enough at going this quickly with changes, one of the other great things is that if something does go wrong in production, Either you can back it out or you can change it and you can still even, you can go through your pipeline again and get really fast feedback that your change is safe to push out to correct the problem. And so so I think many teams that you sort of work to roll forward. So so um, uh, Amazon, Amazon pushed changes on average to 10,000 servers every 11 seconds. 
they release a change into production every yeah. every 11, 11 point two seconds actually, uh, and on average that change goes to ten, over ten thousand servers. The, less than a thousandth of deployments cause any problems at all, and if they do, they can either instantaneously roll back or they can they can roll you know roll forward because because if you're working at those kinds of rates, if you've automated to that kind of degree, if you've eliminated the variables, constrained the variables to the extent that we're describing. You can be absolutely confident. You're going to get really good at those things, and yeah. you're going to be confident that that you know the next time you push the button, it's going to work because it's it always works. And, and I think that the thing we should also bring up is that when you have a, a proper CI/CD pipeline, it, it, it you enable like, hey, we can you can go to production very very fast, and you, even if you have to roll forward or anything like that, that's key because when something goes wrong you don't want to be making up your plan at that point in time. It, yes. Only bad things will happen when you introduce that change. Like, I hope that this script works. I never tested it. I never ran through anything, but, you know, stuff is breaking. Let's go ahead and make this change. It's kind of like pulling on a bunch of levers and maybe it will cause the, the machine not to break or maybe it'll cause the machine to restart itself. And you don't want to do something like that. You want to follow the exact same process every single time. So you, you, you have that high degree of confidence that what I'm about to do will continue to work. I'm not going to make it worse. I, I, talked, I talked to a, uh, a client uh, at the end of 2019, uh, just before the pandemic started. Um, and they, a very big organization, uh, building very sophisticated machinery as well as software. And their release, their normal release cycle was in, measured in years you know in terms of in terms of what they're going uh, and but but you know but you know they had uh, we were talking about the the development approach and at one point somebody said oh that's a class that's a class seven release so that we can do that in an hour and i said <laughs> hold on a minute okay so what's a class seven release and the class seven release was basically you cross your fingers and you hope that you're not broken everything <laughs> <laughs> Because it, because it's an emergency and you're going to push something out. I don't want to be in that situation, and I don't want to have a cl seven classes of release. I, yeah. I would like I would like to have one class of release, and I would like to use that same mechanism every single time, whatever the nature of the change. So if I'm changing the version of the operating system, I'm going to commit that and put that through my deployment pipeline and run all the tests against the change. If I'm changing performance characteristics of a trading engine or something i'm going to put that through a deployment pipeline and measure its characteristics and it's going to go the same every single time if i've got a bug fix if i've got an emergency bug fix if my system's bleeding money in production i still would like my pipeline to be efficient enough that i can put it through the pipeline and i'm not taking any more risks than i'm already taking yeah now not to sound defeatist everything that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so it's going to require quite a culture shift. So if I were to list off some of the things you mentioned, which is uh, TDD, automated testing, building out your testing infrastructure, talking about different branching strategies, building out a CI CD pipeline, uh, kind of shifting to this engineering scientific mind shift, mind shift. If you were to get started, especially for large organizations, what would be an expected time frame to go from scratch to kind of get to this whole CI CD nirvana? Like what was that? What does that expected journey look like for people? It, uh, of of course, it's variable by organization and by context. But most of the things that I talk about, I, I, I kind of when I talk about numbers, I usually like to try and have some data to back up what I talk about. And in this instance, I don't. So what I'm about to say is purely subjective. It's just what I see from my sample set with my clients. But in my experience, what I usually see is that for most kind of organizations in my my perception the communist state which is kind of cargo cult scrum they, they kind of think they're doing scrum but they're not really if you get most most organizations starting from that point and they want to achieve continue they want to get good at continuous delivery what i usually say to them is it's going to take you about three or four months of transition where you will be going slower you're going mm -hmm. to be learning you know, this is a radical shift in the way in which you think about practice and, you know, and apply software development. It's big change and it's going to take a long time to get that right. But for the first three months, just getting the basics in place, just getting the starting point, you're probably going to have to be learning some stuff and to introducing new technologies and getting that up and running. You're going to go slower for about three or four months if you're going to apply this, you know, 
in its in an established team. At that point, you'll be going at least as fast as you would be going before, but you'll be in much better shape. And from then on, and pretty much forever, you'll start going faster and faster and faster, be more yeah. and more efficient. And to get good at it, you're then on kind of the up ramp, but you're, you're probably going to take a couple of years before you're, you know, for an organization of any size, are really any good at this because it's such a deep cultural change. It's such a, a big change, which is the problem. I, I mean, if, if, if I could sell it in a can, I would be a very wealthy man because it does <laughs> produce better software faster. Um, but but it, it takes a lot of hard work and it takes this hardest of all, it takes this kind of flip in your mind. You have to think differently about, I think it makes you think differently about what software development really is and the, certainly the way in which you undertake it. And so, and so, and that's difficult. That's difficult for an individual. It's even more difficult for organizations to establish that kind of change. So it takes time. And, and that's what, ta- it's not the technology that's difficult. It's not the, it's not really the practices that's difficult. It's getting people to think about things differently. That's the really hard part. Oh, absolutely. Because it, it's, I, I still remember it was so hard to convince a number of different developers that, this is the reason why we're writing our tests. You need to do this so we know that the code that you're releasing is going to work. And yeah. even then, it was kind of it, it, sometimes it was it was kind of like pulling teeth. And they said, "Oh, we wrapped a test around it." And I looked at the test, and it was they just, you know, in, 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 initiated the class, ran the function, and then just verified that they got back a true. But they didn't really do any other additional setup. I'm like, that's not really a test. That's just running code. Um, and so again, it was a mind shift. It's like, no, you need to get, you need to get kind of, you need to shift around how you're thinking. It's also changing around how you architect uh, things. One of the biggest uh, lessons that I learned, at least it was probably about 10 years ago now, uh, was solid implementing solid principles. That was such a mind shift when that was first introduced to me. I'm like, oh, interface separation. Well, I like this, you know, it, those kinds of different things. And it, it takes a while. And I, I, if I was going to start from scratch today, I always think back to what is my sphere of influence? So if I was a tech lead, my sphere of influence is I can probably set up a CI server pretty quickly because that's just how my how my team is going to build the code and how we're going to test the code. It's not going to really affect anybody else. Now, when I talk about now my deployment software, well, now I have to bring in QA, DBAs, web admins to talk through all of that. And so maybe it's going to be a little bit it's going to take a little bit more time, but yes, we can do that. But then there's going to be other things that are just completely out of my control. And it's, it's kind of funny because I know that in talking to you that not everyone starts out with like, hey, I'm just going to build out a CI server and call it good. It's they, yeah. kind of, they kind of attack it from different approaches. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, 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 there's a lot of different starting points, but I, I, I think the fundamental one is one that we've already talked about, which is this this focus on starting to work to optimize for fast feedback. And, mm-hmm. and however, yeah. you know, whatever step you take, you know, if you go from it taking you a year to find out whether your change is good to six months, that's a, that's a huge step forward. Oh yeah, it's not great six months, but it's but it's a big step forward. And it's actually a relatively easy step forward compared to some of the, the later stages. The other thing to pick up on what you were describing there is, is, is that the importance of this kind of change mindset, I think, in, in an organization. And I came across a, a lovely um, uh, description of this very recently. I did, uh, I did a, a video on my YouTube channel with Ino Corey, who's written a book about uh, retrospectives. And she introduced me to an idea called the soup exercise, which I had heard of before. And so, so whether you're an individual or a team you know, and you've got some problems, start off by kind of putting the problems that you have control of in a circle. Uh, and then you draw a concentric circle outside of that one and all of the problems where you can influence other people to, to you know, to, to change the way that they work, to be able to do things, you put in that circle and everything else is in the soup. You can't change those things. And so yeah. stop worrying about them because now, you, you know, if you are, you're just complaining. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do about that. But it focuses your minds on the things that you can change. And I think that we're not very good at that. I, I, I often meet developers who will say, my boss won't let me do a good job. He won't let me, you know, they won't let me write tests. They won't let me, you know, automate the configuration or whatever else it is that they want to do. 
And th that's very rarely true. That, and that should be in their control because, you know, if you're a chef, you don't, you don't wait for your boss to tell you that you're allowed to wash up as you go, you know, yeah. <laughs> to sharpen your tools as you're working. You know that that's what you do. You, you decide that that's how you're going to work. So you, there are choices that we can make. Even if we're the most junior developer on a team, we can make some choices about how we decide to do carry out our work. So we can start there and we can do those things. And then we can try and influence other people to, 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 you know, to do more. One of the things that I, I've thought about for a long time, I hadn't heard of the soup exercise before, but, which I liked. But one of the things that I've thought about for a long time as somebody that's kind of played a tech leadership role in teams, sort of being tech principal or tech lead kind of on, on technical teams, is what I always try and do, whatever the situation is, kind of put my arms around as much of the problem as I can so that I, you know, we can take control. And to exactly to your example, so one of the things that that encourages me to do, I want all of the skills that, that are necessary to achieve a releasable outcome within the scope of the team. You know, mm -hmm. I want testers and, and QAs or product owners and developers or operations people, whoever's necessary to achieve the outcome as part of the team so that we can collaborate closely and learn from one another and, and do a great job. Um, and, you know, again, we can think of that in terms of uh, optimizing for feedback and so on and optimizing for learning, but that's, you know, that, that's what we need to do to, to achieve this. But, but taking ownership is, is, you know, of the things that we can change is um, uh, of vital importance. And, and again, to refer back to the data from the State of DevOps report, um, uh, the, the, the highest correlation between high performing teams who are deploying thousands of times more frequently than others and with high, you know, much higher quality and, and you know, much, more, much less rework and all those kind of good stuff. The highest correlation between those people is that the teams can make, short, make, make a change without asking for permission from anybody outside of the team. Mm -hmm. So trying to That's take responsibility for your work and being able to say, this isn't going well, let's change the way that this is, this is, let's change the way that we're approaching solving this problem because the people close to the work are best placed to understand how to make it do better, to do a better job. Yeah, and I always, I always think back to the time I was working at a bank and, you know, working at a bank, you have auditors, you have, regula you have regulations and everything along those lines. I can't change that. That is part of working at a bank. And yeah. Why, why spend all my time getting all frustrated about that? It's like, oh, it's more along the lines of, okay, this is, these are the requirements. I will, I can build this, but I can build a system that will meet these requirements as long as, as long as you're happy with that. And most of the time, everyone's like, great, you met exactly what we we're looking for. Um, and I can move on with my day because we've already met the, we've met their requirements. Absolutely. And, and, and those, that's an interesting set of requirements um, uh, in its own right. I, I, one of my, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm involved in is I've done a lot of work with organizations that work in very regulated industries, healthcare, finance, uh, telecoms, automotive, those sorts of things. And in those kinds of industries, that can be a serious burden. Uh, you know, you, you can, as we were talking about at the outset, you know, you, you, Volvo were going really, really slowly because of all that kind of stuff. And But recognising that that's in the soup, it's stuff that you can't change. You, you're not going to be able to force the regulator to change how the regulation works, but you have to comply. So how do you build a buffer? How do you, how do you find a way of working as quickly and efficiently as you can, but still meeting the intent of that regulation, still being able to do that? And, you know, you end up doing things like continuous compliance so that you use your deployment pipeline to help you solve some of those problems and give all of the people that, that need the audit trails and stuff, all of the information that they need, but you, you generate, generate it as a side effect of how you work and so on. So I, I, it's, I think it's useful to think about those sorts of things, but, you know, this stuff you can't change. You've got to work within certain constraints, and that's important to recognize, I think. Awesome. Derek, do we have any uh, questions? Great question. Uh, we do. We have a, a few. Obviously, we have <laughs> overrun a little bit, so the likelihood uh, for all attendees is we are going to just run past a little bit past the, the half hour. Um, but some great questions. Uh, we have one from Angelo. Uh, Angelo is asking, how do you balance the approach of committing frequently versus committing releasable code? 
So, so primarily, it's a matter of uh, a mix of the things that I've spoken about. So, so we're going to use very high level of, of test automation, test driven development. So each change in its own right, so each atomic change is good. It, it works to some level of working. Um, the system overall works because we're going to be running acceptance tests and the other kind of validations in the acceptance cycle to prove that the software is releasability. So we can determine those kinds of things. Uh, and then as we start to worry about, you know, just, you know, if we're, if we're making changes that are coherent, we start to use the techniques that I mentioned before, sort of dark releasing, uh, branch by abstraction and feature toggles to isolate that change in production. Now, if you think about this, weirdly that's kind of a form of information hiding too a bit like branching but it's different in a significant way in the in that we're not branching the code the 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 source code we are branching the behavior of the system and that's different just for an example let's imagine that we're working on a team that's operating a bunch of feature branches and um, I want to make a change. I want to do a, one of those nasty broad brush refactorings that's going to change something in a small way, but everywhere. Um, and I, it's almost impossible for me to be able to do that without either messing myself up or messing my teammates up. If I get the change in first, then all of them have got a horrible merge problem. If they get their changes in, they're going to break my merge of, of this changing everywhere. And that's going to be a dynamic picture that I need to stay on top of. So I've, I've been in situations where it was almost literally impossible for us to make that kind of broad brush change. So we ended up not doing it. Um, behavioral changes though because we're, we're committing all of these things to, to trunk all of the time we can make those kinds of changes and even though the behavior is isolated it's still there we can still do things like try it out so let's imagine that we want to introduce a new service to our system we could start off by first doing the bare bones of the service it just kind of starts something up and it just you know says hey, I'm here for, you know, in response to a health check or something like that. That would be progress. It would be useful. It's the kind of stuff that you could do in, you know, uh, an hour or two maybe and get that out into production and, and it's in your monitoring system. It's there saying, yeah, I'm here, not doing anything useful yet, but I'm, I'm here. And then you could imagine kind of fleshing out the implementation of that service with more detail over time until it becomes useful and you could then connect it up to some UI or or to you could decide to allocate that to certain groups of beta testers or however else you wanted to manage it. So I think it gives you some more options. And um, it, it, it's, certain, it's certainly possible to do this for even very sophisticated changes. One of the things that we did with um, our exchange was that we built um, a fault tolerant clustering asynchronous messaging service mesh. Uh, kind of system that would that would host our mesh and we did that drip by drip by drip in, in kind of the way that we're describing through the life of the pro product excellent thank you very much steve unfortunately that is now half past um there are other questions um particularly a shout out to shane if i could get you to email your questions to advice that's advice at octopus.com uh, Bob will get to those. Um, so I just want to thank Bob and Dave so much uh, for the webinar. Um, it's funny, I obviously ran through a few run-throughs and it's even better live. Uh, even I learned uh, some bits there. So special uh, thanks to Bob and Dave. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so just to wrap up very briefly, um, like I said at the beginning of today's webinar, uh, the, an email will be sent to you within the next 24 to 48 hours with a link to the recording on YouTube. Um, we do have some upcoming events where we're going to be talking delivering database DevOps with Liquibase and Octopus Deploy. That's uh, Social Architect Sean Cessna and Mike Olivas from uh, Liquibase. And then I'm back with Gregor Suti uh, on the 19th and the 20th um, talking about accelerating Azure DevOps in Azure with Octopus, um, and that'll be on the 19th and the 20th of May. You can check those, those out on octopus.com forward slash events. 
thank you uh, to everyone for coming along today. Um, if you do ever have any questions, please reach out to uh, adviceoctopus.com uh, and have a great day.